Uh, right, uh, I know we have a very special guest today, uh, and so I'm not going to keep uh, you or him waiting too long. Uh, so let me very quickly uh, a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to get started. So first thing, uh, as you probably know, is we're a big fan of B1G1 and making the world a better place. So every time we do a live session uh, for everybody that attends live, we make a, con a contribution to a project somewhere around the world. And for the month of December, we're going to be providing uh, rechargeable lighting to, for, for safe child delivery for a day. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for coming live. At the end of the session, we get a report of all the people here live, and then for each and every one of you, we will make a contribution to that particular project. Uh, I can see that Lisa uh, is, is here. So, Lisa, you were, I, I believe, uh, you were on the original live stream, and uh, and then of course we had some technical problems, and you've now found this one, which is great. I can see people still are trickling in from various places. Okay, second announcement before we get started. Second announcement is, oh, we've got people coming in all the time now, which is great. Uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl is here as well. Hi there, Cheryl. Sorry about the challenges getting in today, uh, but uh, we're, we're up and running now, which is awesome. Uh, second announcement very quickly is I have recently uh, written a book, an ebook, 28 page ebook on how to price cleanup work. A lot of people tell me they struggle with that. And so if you would like a copy of that book, then what's going to happen is Sarah's going to be putting in a link to uh, the, the comments box and she'll put it in the description afterwards. Uh, and we have some other things to tell you about later with some links. Uh, okay, before I uh, introduce my very special guest, uh, I can now see that loads of people are piling in. So let me just give a, uh, a few uh, shout outs we have. We have Bill Robinson is here. Hi, Bill. Great to see you. Uh, we also have from up in Canada. Whoops, missed it. Liz, Lynn is here. Hi, Lynn. Good to see you again. We have Sharon Turner is here. Uh, Linda Rolf is back. I saw, Linda, that you were on the original YouTube that then stopped for whatever reason. It wouldn't play the video. Jim's back, which is great. I saw you as well over there. Jennifer Henderson is here. David Colts from, uh, from Texas. Hi there, David. Great to see you. Oh, and Lisa says, oh, oh, yes, please. So Lisa's saying yes to the ebook. Lisa, be patient. Sarah will put the link in, in the chat box at some point in the next few minutes. So just watch out for that link coming in. Right, I think that's enough of me waffling on because actually we have a very special speaker uh, that uh, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time now because uh, this, uh, this is the person that really changed my life in a major way. I first met him I think it was back in 1999, and it was uh, this person. His name is Ron Baker, you know. It's Ron Baker. He had a huge impact. I was running my accounting firm back in those days, and I had never heard of value pricing until the end of 1999, and I, I read his first book. It had a huge impact on me. I made changes in my, tax, in my accounting firm at the time that had an instant impact. Uh, the first thing I used, uh, the first thing I did was I repriced a particular service and got over three times the price for the next few years. It was extraordinary stuff. So without any more waffle from me, I want to bring on my, my hero, mentor, and friend, Ron Baker. Uh, hi there, Ron. How are you there? Hi, Mark. I'm great. How are you? Awesome. Uh, I was really good, just feeling a little bit stressed. It's been one of those days where uh, we've had a wall collapse outside uh, overnight, wow because of we, we've got record rainfall in Portugal right now, which is strange. Better than perhaps snow and ice in, in the UK and Canada. But anyway, record rainfall, wall fell down. So we've been trying to sort that out. And of course, the live stream didn't work for whatever reason. But I can see people are coming all the time now. So uh, we're back up and running. And how are you, Ron? I am great. I just got back from uh, a week of conferences, digital CPA in uh, Austin, Texas, and then uh, QBC in Las Vegas. Uh, I saw some of the, uh, well, I've seen, I've seen, my Facebook feed is full of people posting photos from QBC. And, uh, and yes, I was very envious because I've not been now since before the pandemic. That was the last time I saw you, Ron, I think, probably that, that I QBC. Think that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I saw you had an interesting, uh, I guess, an interesting conversation, a one-sided conversation with poor old Hector, uh, who couldn't speak, but he did say he was the best conversation he had with you. 
Yeah, the longest because he couldn't speak probably. Um, yeah, he had a throat issue, but I guess everything's okay. So he's slowly starting to talk and uh, hopefully he'll he'll be back to normal soon. I hope so. I can't imagine Hector Garcia without talking. It's, it's just oh, no <laughs> kidding. I mean, he's the guy's prolific. <clears throat> yeah. He is. He sure is. Uh, okay, we. I've got some questions for you, Ron. We're going to learn about subscription pricing, and and you have this. Uh, you have a brand new book out, which at this stage, Ron, I would love to show it to people and say, "Here's the book. Go and grab it." And we will put some <laughs> links in later on. But I'm in Portugal, as you probably know, Ron. The post is terrible here. It's not arrived yet. I got a a, no. a, a message two weeks ago from the that CTT, the equivalent of our post office, saying it's been held up in customs and I had to approve it, which I did. And I thought within days of that it would arrive, but it's it's not. But fortunately, I, I did. you did kindly send me the pre-publication copy. So I have read it. I just can't show it to people right now. But perhaps you can. <laughs> well, there you perhaps go. you can. There you I, go. I, That's, there the you go. That's the book. That's the book that I am it. desperately waiting for. <clears throat> So we're yeah. going to talk about that today. Uh, for those of you who have never been to one of these sessions before, if you have a question, please feel free to ask. Uh, we're going to spend some time towards the end answering any questions that come in. Uh, the, you know the drill now. If you have a question for Ron or me, just put QQ in front because there's going to be lots of comments, as I can see, people commenting all the time like Toby. Um, so just put QQ in front so I, I can see those questions. Uh, okay. Um, Ron, uh, I was, I mean, we want to talk about subscription pricing uh, and the book, but the, the kind of first thing that, that I would mention is, is it's not just you that wrote it. It's the another one of my heroes, uh, the amazing Paul Dunn. Uh, and I think it's the sequel, if I if I got it right, Ron, it's the sequel to Firm of the Future. Well, that's what the publisher's idea originally was uh, when they contacted us. They said, you know, we published Firm of the Future in 2013. We're coming up on 2023. Would you guys like to do an update? And I said, look, I don't, I'm don't. i not interested in updating old books, not interested in writing old books, want to write new books. So I have a new idea and I'd like, I'll propose that to you. And I proposed this subscription business model to them and they loved it. So we did that. So it's not technically an update, but it, it's kind of like how, how has the world changed in the 20 years since we did Firm of the Future? I would say this would be part two. Yeah, this is how okay. the business model has evolved. And I remember reading *Firm of the Future*, which I think you'll have to remind me. Was it two thousand and two or two thousand and four that came out? It, it was three. Two thousand three. <laughs> so, so it's exactly two years. I'll, I'll be approximately <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Close enough. I, I was in the process of exiting, exiting my sole practitioner business at the time, uh, and I remember that had a huge impact on me. And and I've been recommending it for years since. It's one of the best books ever written. So uh, as well as rushing out to buy subscription pricing, everybody here should rush out and buy Firm of the Future because even though that was 2003, a lot of that still, a lot of there's a lot of really powerful thinking there that still people are struggling to adapt, uh, ad adapt, adopt in their, in their firms. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, um, to, it, it was a tough act to follow because I'm really proud of Firm of the Future. It still sells really well. And it's, it's held up quite well for 20 years. I mean, I, I write this in the new book. People always ask, Paul and I both, um, what would you guys change in Firm of the Future? And I said, not much. You know, I, I would change some li linguistic things. I might change some words here and there. But the concepts around intellectual capital, efficiency versus effectiveness, those are practically timeless. And even some core pricing principles, they're timeless. And I'm... I'm uh, Really, I was really happy with that book. And of course, it was wonderful to work with Paul because like you, Mark, he's my hero as well. Absolutely. And I think you met him a little bit before I did. I met him in, in middle of 1999 at the at the four-day accountants boot camp. That was my first time meeting Paul, but I think you'd met him before then. I met him on April 30th, 1996. It's still a day we celebrate. And um, I was at a Cal... California Society of CPA function. He, he was doing a boot camp preview and I sat there and I was just mesmerized. And then I got to speak with him at a conference in 1998 in San Diego. And I just remember we went out to dinner afterwards in the Marriott uh, hotel. And we, I mean, we stayed there till like 2 a.m. I mean, they literally had to kick us out 
because we were just sitting there talking and I was just blown away by this guy. And then of course I got to tour with him in Australia and the UK and all over the United States doing the boot camp preview. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that must have been awesome. Uh, and as many people who are here listening today, uh, I often cite my, my three heroes, the three people who had the biggest impact on my career was uh, Steve Pipe, who many people here know, I've had him on the show before, Paul Dunn, uh, and you, the, the three of you are, my, are the people that had the biggest impact. Complete, I completely changed my accounting firm from based on what I learned from the three, the three of you. So, so a huge, a huge thank you because I wouldn't be here today <laughs> without you. And it was Paul Dunn that actually introduced me to you. So a big, so that's why I, uh, Paul particularly has a, a, a place in my heart for for recommending I, I reach out to you. Well, it's awesome what you've been doing, Mark. You've been really spreading the word on pricing and really helping the profession worldwide. So I, I just, that's awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ron. And, and, and this is, I, I do these live streams regularly and I love going on stage and being live and I don't get nervous about doing live sessions ever until today. I think, I thought, I'm interviewing Ron. <laughs> and that got me all uh, panicking a bit because <laughs> I kind of... I, I bow down to you because uh, yeah. you're because <laughs> uh, you're you're thinking. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, let's, so, so, Ron, let's start with let's start with a definition of subscription pricing because I know you've been talking about this for a few years now, and I still find people they get it wrong. They don't really know what subscription pricing. I still see some people thinking of fixed pricing and flat fees as being a form of subscription pricing. So, let's have the definition. Let's understand that. Okay, first off, it's not pricing, it's a business model. It, subscription is not a pricing method. It's much more than the cadence of your payment terms. A lot of people say, oh, we do subscription because we take an annual price. Whether that's developed by hourly billing or by value pricing principles, and we divide it by 12, and then people pay us monthly, so that's subscription. That's not subscription. Subscription is an entirely new business model. It has to be re-engineered from the ground up, meaning how you create value, how you deliver that value, and how you monetize that value is all different under subscription than it is under certainly hourly billing and even under value pricing. Just one quick example. There's no more scope out of scope in subscription. It's more covered, not covered. Uh, big difference. It's no longer about pricing the customer. It's about pricing the relationship. But it's also, and this is key, it's also about plussing your offering. You have to go to the market with a plussed offering. Now, that means, in my mind, convenience, peace of mind, frictionless to the customer. Everybody today is comparing us to Amazon. They're comparing your firm's digital interaction. The whole experience of your firm is being compared to Amazon, whether you like it or not because Amazon has set the bar, because they're so customer focused. And I just think that we need to up our game. Subscription forces us to up our game. So in my mind, the definition of subscription is a periodic recurring payment for frictionless, ever increasing value and serial transformations. Now, Mark, that's a suitcase term that requires a ton of unpacking. I know it's clunky, I don't care. I wanted to get it out there. We'll clean up the language later. One of the things I learned about writing this book is we don't even have good language around subscription. Mm -hmm. We don't know what to call it. We, we, we have these fuzzy terms, customer success, all these different terms that, that is used in subscription businesses, but they're really hard because a lot of them are still applying old thinking just to new ideas just like we called the automobile the horseless carriage right we we explain the new in terms of language with by using the old like a digital wallet for bitcoin there's no wallet in bitcoin right but that's how we have to transition and we're in this transition point with this with this uh, entire model so the language is going to be kind of clunky and i i just don't care about that we'll, we'll clean up the language as we go but we're on a big learning curve with this not every issue has been solved. Just like when we started value pricing, that whole movement, we didn't have answers for everything. We knew we were on a learning curve. And it's the same thing with subscription. Yeah. And I remember that when we were last chatting in, well, last saw you in California, 
and you you were talking about subscription pricing uh, back then you were also referring to it as value pricing 2.0 but from what you just said you're now talking it's being it's more like a yeah. different business model so are you now are you still referring to it as value pricing 2.0 or do you think only affectionately happened? only just because it's easier for us to say vp 10 and vp 20 to explain the differences but no it is a it's a totally different business model change yeah and what do you see as being the if a firm was to move to a subscription pricing model what are the benefits of doing that why would they want to think about doing that well first off you have predictable annual recurring revenue so you're starting on the 50 yard line uh, excuse the football analogy but you're starting on the 50 yard line every day you're not starting on the goal line you don't have to constantly feed that funnel recurring revenue is going to be more highly valued when you go to sell your firm it we're seeing multiples of three to seven and even higher and this is coming from john warlow who's mm -hmm. also an expert in subscription he wrote the book, book uh, built to sell and of course he helps professional firms sell their business so he's got a big database of sales and he tracks multiples and he's seeing massive multiples over and above you know just what he calls reoccurring revenue recurring revenue is is much more valuable um, so those are two of the big things the other thing is you have predictable workflow the other thing is you have less customers so you always have spare capacity i mean i i can't believe how many professionals run at full capacity for example i called my eye surgeon back you know, on october 1st because I needed a eye exam, new prescription that had expired, and I needed new lenses because my lenses were scratched. He couldn't see me until the end of January. Now, Mark, that's that's a dispensable relationship in my mind. Mm. He's completely wasted my time. I have to go find another doctor, go through all this rigmarole. I think the biggest sin today is wasting our customers' time. If we're going to track time in this profession, we should track the time that we save the customer and we should track the time they spend with us. We have no business tracking time internally, but the customer's time, we need to we need to savor that and save them time. And I'm gonna read this guy the riot act. And I love this guy, he's my eye surgeon, I love him. But I'm gonna say, doc, you're crazy. I couldn't get into you for four months. How many patients do you have? This is crazy. You should have a line, a subscription plan, where I can go right to the front of the line and get same day or next day appointment. The fact that he's that far booked in advance, how can he be helping anybody? That's probably not why he joined the profession, but mm -hmm. he's in a fee for service model. And that's the big thing to me. It, just as we railed Mark against trading time for hours, we know that's a crappy business model. I'll tell you, I don't think it's much better to trade services for dollars. We need to get away from the idea that our services are what's valuable. Stacking up services brick by brick, scope of work. We're, we're so far, we're, we're so far beyond in terms of value, the sum of our scope of works. And yet the way value pricing has been implemented in a lot of firms is they differentiate based on scope of work, like the three different options mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think, I think we need to move beyond that because sometimes you can subscribe, uh, subtract services and be more valuable. It's, it's not so much the services, they're merely a means to an end. The end is the transformation, and that's the last part of that definition, that we can provide serial transformations. We can actually move the customer from where they are to some desired future state, and we can do it over and over and over again from womb to tomb over the course of the life of a customer, and that's really the apogee of value is providing those transformations it's not the services it's the transformations and i think our language and our marketing and our branding needs to reflect that and it isn't right now we're, we're still caught up in scope of work and efforts and oh well, this is out of scope you added more employees you added you know you added another checking account we have to go to the department of paperwork and get a change order that's all a waste of the customer's time in my mind and, and this model forces you to streamline that and, and provide a better experience. And, and one of the things about the model that, uh, I, if I understand your definition correct, and I think I do, is that essentially we're saying that 
other than perhaps having some different classes of customer, every customer is paying the same subscription, just like everyone pays the same subscription to Amazon Prime, to, to Netflix. And rather than it being, each individual customer gets their own unique subscription based on the scope of the work. That's, that's more flat fees, value pricing. It's not, it, it, subscription is about pretty much everybody within a tier is paying the same subscription. Have I got that right? I think that's correct. If, now, that's easier to do if you're niched. And uh, this, this, to me, this is not a pricing issue. This comes down to a strategy issue and a positioning issue. Are you trying to be a, a, you know, a high-end steakhouse? Are you trying to be McDonald's? Or are you trying to be a vegan restaurant? Well, if you're trying to be all three, then your pricing is going to be all over the board. For example, I'll give you a concrete example. I was at Intuit a, couple, a month ago talking about this model, and somebody said, well, my sweet spot in terms of customer size is you know, businesses in this industry between five and $10 million. He said, but listen, we have, we have some $50 million customers. We have some 75 million, maybe 100 million. So, you know, a handful of these outliers. And I said, well, then you got to make a choice. You can't, you can't be all things to all people. You have to stay in your lane. And to me, that's not a pricing issue. The question about that isn't, well, how do I price those outliers? No, it's the wrong question. My question is, why do you have those outliers? If you want a repeatable, you know, saleable, more valuable business, you got to be focused, right? This is the difference between HP and Apple. HP's got 15,000 SKUs. They try and be, you know, all things to all people. Apple's got less than 100. But they are 100 of the world beating products. And that's why their market cap is so much higher. So it's really about focus. And if you're focused, if you're well niched, then I do believe you can have just one price for everybody. And I also think that you don't have to have three options anymore. This is, I think, one of the tenets of value pricing that, that blows up. Now, Mark, before when we talked about value pricing, we always say, oh, you got to have three options. Don't do two, because if you put two out there, more times than not, people, you know, majority of people will pick the lower price because exactly. it becomes a price decision. That's not true in subscription because it's a different business model. It's got a different revenue model. It's got a different profit formula. It's completely different. So it required me to unlearn a bunch of things that, you know, are just in my DNA, just like hourly billing was in our DNA. And we had to unlearn a lot of that, move to value pricing. Um, this is a different model and it's and it forces you to kind of reconsider everything. And strategy and positioning is at the top of that list, even before you get to pricing. Absolutely. I, and I remember that you you shared with me that the, the, that video, the backwards bicycle, and that the, the biggest right. issue is, is, is trying to unlearn stuff is harder than learning. I think that's so true uh, in, th in this particular instance. So another question, I know we've talked about this before. So you've already mentioned and touched on the fact that to, to, to have a subscription pricing model, you need to. You really need to be niching more. You cannot be a generalist. So I think that's, there's a lot of truth in that. Let's talk about something else. Just a, a, con, a controversial topic, and, and and that's this whole thing about timesheets. Which I know your view on timesheets, uh, <laughs> and and I and I share them. Uh, and and when it comes to value pricing, as I, as we both say, you cannot timesheets cannot be used for pricing. Uh, and then we but we we get firms that have are moving to value pricing, but they still think they need to keep the timesheets. And they give reasons like measuring measuring profitability per client and their team and stuff like that. I know we had a conversation in California a few years back uh, where it was about if if you're going to... You, you cannot successfully move to a subscription-based model and keep timesheets. That's kind of what I would suggest. You cannot, because if you keep timesheets... It's, they're completely pointless measures in a subscription-based model. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I, I can tell you, when, anytime you change a business model, at least two things change. One is, obviously, your pricing strategy changes. You know, we've gone from buying $20 CDs to paying a buck a song for iTunes on our iPad. Now, of course, most of us are streaming our music from Spotify or Pandora or Amazon, Apple, whatever. Well, it's the same with subscription. When you move to subscription, there's a totally new income statement. 
the income statement is completely different. It starts with annual recurring revenue. It backs out churn, you know, lost customers, and it adds a, a, a new annual recurring revenue to have an ending balance that actually rolls forward. So subscription is a forward driven profit model like the stock market it doesn't its income statement doesn't look backwards it's not interested in matching you know costs with the revenue it doesn't do any of that because it it it's it's focused on annual recurring revenue and of course from there you model lifetime customer value and what's great about subscription mark is because we have all these venture capitalists involved in in funding a lot of these unicorns they have developed the kpis for subscription so these things are well developed in my book i cite two uh reports from andreessen horowitz the this is the famous venture capital firm in silicon valley that's you know funded all sorts of uh these successful companies and they've issued two big reports on all the kpis they use to analyze a subscription business these are well documented well tested empirically uh kpis there's no room in any of those KPIs for any time-based measurement because you're looking at the, the portfolio overall. So when we talk about subscription, we say price the relationship, mm -hmm. not the customer. And you're also pricing the portfolio because you're looking at it overall. And I should add that I think because of the fact that you're plussing the offering, like this is Walt Disney's term, plussing, you know, you're constantly adding and delighting the customer, just like Amazon Prime does with its members, right? It's putting out new content, it's giving us new uh, benefits every day, all of these different things. And when you do that, now you're going to the market with an uncommon offering. And an uncommon offering can command an uncommon price. And I think it, it can take anywhere from one and a half to four, five, six times more than the price you're charging now under this model. Because this model is a form of insurance too, because it's basically saying to the customer, look, if you need it and we're capable of doing it, there's the constraint by the way, which means you can say no to a customer who asks you to do something that you've never done before. Um, but if they need it and we can do it, you're covered. There's no department of paperwork. There's no change order. There's no redrafting the fixed price agreement. No, we just do it because we're not focused anymore on the math of the moment. We're focused on the customer lifetime value. We are building annuities under this model that are more valuable than the cost of acquiring them. It's a different profit formula. Absolutely. And, and, and I'd like to come back to this, this whole idea of, of, of plus, uh, plusing and, uh, and what that could, could do. But before I do that, I think my next question is, there's going to be people listening to this who are very skeptical, skeptical, who are thinking, I'm not selling pre-made videos like Netflix. I, I'm selling complex services. Every client's different. Uh, and, and, and some people are thinking, and, and I thought this, when, I, when, I, when you first said this to me some years ago, I'm thinking, I can't see how this could possibly work in a professional services business. And then you explained to me, and I know it's in the book, and I think it's worth perhaps spending a bit of time about this. You explained... 10, 10, 20 years ago now, something like that, about the, the MD squared, I think it is, the, the, that particular model in the medical industry. And when you explained that to me, that's when the light bulb went on for me. I thought, well, if it can work in that industry, why can't it work in the accounting profession? So perhaps you want to tell us a little bit about MD squared. Right. This is, the, this is a great point. A lot of people get tied up. They, they try and equate um, you know, everything to Netflix. Well, Netflix digital... Uh, and it doesn't cost the marginal cost of adding another net subs uh, Netflix subscriber is practically zero. But Mark, I would just want to make a comment on that. Um, the marginal cost of met Netflix is not zero for adding a new subscriber because, I mean, if th that might be true in terms of just, you know, putting them on the streaming service. Netflix has to buy the most expensive human capital in the world <laughs> producers directors actors and they constantly have to come up with new content that's why they're they're in such debt <laughs> because they're funding this so this idea that you know it, it, there's no marginal cost at netflix is kind of insane but back to md squared howard moran was the team doctor for the seattle sonics and he was a general physician, and when one of the players got hurt on the court in an NBA game, he could go out there 
because he knew everything about these guys. He knew their their if they had medical issues, if they were taking any drugs, he knew their medical history so well, he could get them back in the game. And he said to himself, why can't I do this for my patients? Well, because the an average general physician uh, in his day and now today even has about 2,400 patients, which means they have 50 to 60 appointments per day and they get to spend a total of five minutes with you. Most of the time they're in front of their laptop typing into your electronic health records. They're not even looking at you and they're just curing your presenting problem. They're not helping you stay healthy. They're not doing preventative medicine. They're just, you know, curing what you came in with. And he said, he, he said, this is not why I became a doctor. He said, I became a doctor to help people. Most people, when you ask them, why did you become an accountant, a bookkeeper, a CPA, is to help people. How can we help people if we have a thousand customers? We're kidding ourselves. Relationships don't scale. They don't scale. We need time. Just like my doctor couldn't see me for four months. And when I do get to see him, I get to see him for three minutes. His, his PA does most of the work. Um, that's not the type of relationship I think that he went into medicine for. So MD squared limits the each doctor to 50 families. That's it. That's their capacity. Now, these are high end doctors. They're, they're, they're concierge doctors. So they go after the top 10% of the wealth earners in the country. Basically it was like, it's like $24,000 per year plus another two or 3000 per kid to do this. But, when you are one of their patients, um, you get complete access to them 24-7, 365. You can text them, you can email them, they will come to your office, they'll come to your home, they'll even fly overseas if you're there and coordinate care and you know all, all sorts of other things that they do to keep you healthy. So after, and this was founded by the way in 1996, and just to give you an example of how inadequate our language is about this, when I read about MD squared, and I don't think I found it until about 2000, and I wrote about it in one of my books, Pricing on Purpose, and you know what I called it? I called it retainer-based medicine. Well, Mark, it's not a retainer. You're paying them two grand a month for access to them. You're paying for that peace of mind, that convenience, that when you need them, they are there, and they are there that day. When you walk into these doctor's offices, they don't even have waiting rooms. They lock the door behind you because you're usually the only one in there and they can give at the average appointment is one to two hours, not five minutes. And that means they can keep you healthy. That means they can help you with other things, weight program and diet and other things that you that you're interested in doing. Uh, and to me, that's the model. Now, after concierge doctors came on the scene about another 10 years direct primary care doctors came on the scene and they didn't go after the top 10%. They went after the middle class and even the lower middle class. So they have different price points, just like we see with hotels, right? We have, we can stay at a Ritz Carlton Four Season, but you can also stay, you know, at a Hilton Garden Inn. So there's all, and every price point in between, same things happening in the medical profession, at least here in the United States with these doctors. And we've interviewed a doctor, a direct primary care doctor. He's out of Detroit. So he works in a, economic area that is let's just say lower average income than 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 most and he's less than 100 bucks a month he maxes out at 600 patients and he since we've talked to him over the past four years um he's grown from being one doctor he started up right out of residency he didn't go he never went into a fee for service model because he knew that was a life of burnout and he said i want to do this type of medicine and since we've talked to him in these four years, he's added three doctors. He's about to open up a second office, add two more doctors, and all of these doctors fill up to 550, 600 patients, and then that's it. They're maxed out. They have a waiting list of patients waiting to get in. Um, and I think that's the model. And they basically, you're covered for anything they can do. Now, that means they're not going to do knee surgery. They're not going to replace your hip. They're not going to do cardiac surgery. If you come in with any of that, that it's outside of their lane, they're going to, they're going to refer you to a specialist and they'll even go to those appointments with you to coordinate the care. They'll still quarterback the care, just like CPAs do with the lawyer, the insurance broker, the, you know, the finance, the personal finance person, whatever the insurance, um, we can still coordinate the care but we don't have to do everything. We have to stay in our lane. 
And to me, that's the perfect model because that's why we joined the profession in the first place. I think we need to align our rhetoric. We say as a profession that we put the relationship for, it's all about the relationship, but look at what we monetize. We're monetizing scope of work, services. That's not where it's at anymore, I don't think. Mm. Uh, it's powerful stuff. And I, I, I smiled earlier when you talked about you've had to wait four whole months for, for that appointment. You should try living in the UK with the NHS. <laughs> that would be four months would be, wow, really, that quick? That's pretty impressive. That's, 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 one, yeah, yeah. one of the reasons why 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 we came across to Portugal. And, and actually, when you when you talked about uh, MD squared, I said to Sarah, do you know what? I would love it if there was an equivalent in Portugal because health is so important to me. I just want to be looked after. And I, I think what people need to realize is that there is always a proportion of the marketplace that will pay a premium price to have that peace of mind, to know they're paying the least amount of tax, that, that you've got their back, that you're looking after them, you're thinking about them all the time. Absolutely. Convenience. When they do need you, you're right there. I just, I had a guy come out yesterday to fix my HVAC unit because my um, heater went off. And I'll tell you, that's a pain. It's been really cold here in Northern California, uncharacteristically cold, I might add. And he, uh, I bought into their service plans, 20 bucks a month. And he said, you call us when you're, when you're a member, we'll be out within 24 hours. That's awesome. I'll pay, it, it was worth it just for that. And, and yet there's still other benefits, but it's just that convenient. Again, it's saving people time. I think yep. in today's world, we have more uh, money than time. We've got to save people time. And this profession, I think, is not doing a good job with that. We're sending out people, 200 page tax organizers, Mark. <laughs> this is customer abuse. This is not a good experience. And we wonder why our average MPS score in the accounting profession is 25. And, you know, Apple and BMW and Porsche are at 85. There's a gap there. We need to do better. And, and the word you've mentioned a couple of times there, which I think is so important, is the reason why the subscription model is is so so big now is this word convenience, that people are ha happy to pay subscriptions, even if they're not going to use the, the, the thing they're subscribing to, just because of the convenience. And I, and I think about uh, our challenge today, of you know the, the, the weather in Portugal and our wall fell down. Trying to find somebody who can sort that out fast is almost impossible. I would pay a subscription to a construction man who, if I had a problem at the house, needed sorting, he's round like that to solve it. And it's a, if it's a premium price, then then so be it. And, and that's I think what we've got to think about. It's how can we make something that's convenient for the customer because the right customers will pay for that convenience. They will. And that's where we get the two time, three time, four time multiple, because it is that convenience. And then when they come in and they ask you to do a special project or they need a report or something, maybe on a tight deadline, you just do it because you, now you're just investing in the relationship. And we're even starting to see some firms, especially in the technology space. This is my my co-host, Ed Kluss's world. You know, he works for Sage. So these guys are in implementing CRM systems and ERP systems and accounting software. And they're coming right out of the gate doing these big installations. Now these are 40, 30, 40, 50,000 dollar jobs, but they're just putting people on subscription. And they're not they're not doing like a one-off price for say like a cleanup, like say a bookkeeper cleaning up 7 years or a CPA cleaning up, you know, 5 years worth of uh, unfiled taxes or something. They're just starting out and just saying, no, no, we'll come out, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate early value, we'll get your, system, your new system up and running, and we'll put you on subscription. Now, they're placing a bet. They're, they, they're, they're saying, look, we know we're going to invest this labor in this, and we think it's going to pay off because if we can keep you for one year, we have a 90% probability of keeping you for life. And that's going to be far more valuable than any one-off charge. So we're gonna trust our value. We're gonna demonstrate early value. We're gonna get you addicted and hooked to us. And then you won't be able to, you you won't wanna go anywhere else. They're taking that bet. It, does it pay off all the time? Of course not. But it doesn't pay off all the time under any model, right? Um, so I, I, I just think that is just such a an easier way 
to invest in the relationship. Sure. I know we've got a couple of questions that have come in uh, from Bob Harper and James McKelvey. I will get to those questions. And if anybody else has any questions, just remember, put them in the comments box. Put that QQ in front, just like James has done, so I get to see it. But there's one thing that I, I would like to talk about, going back to this idea of plussing, because I, I know you. one of the big benefits of having a, a subscription pricing business model is it, it then makes the focus on the customer and I think a word that you've used, which I agree with, is is the focus then is on innovation. We have we have to innovate more, and and I think about that because, as you probably know, Ron, I, I run a subscription business, so, so I, I agree with everything that you say because I because it's it's how I run this particular business, and and when I I, I saw that in the book, this the, the fact you focus on the customer and the innovation, one of the things that we do and many people in the Value Pricing Academy know this, is every year we have our strategic planning retreat. We've got all day tomorrow doing that. And one of the things we always ask ourselves is, what more can we do to deliver more value to our paying customers, our subscribers? What can we do? And we don't charge for that. They're just things that they get as extra things. And every year we launch new training, new resources. A few years back, uh, a few years back, we decided to bundle in and give away for free uh, the software, the pricing software that I spent a mortgage on to create. We just give that away to Academy members. Every time we think about what more can we give, because as you've touched on earlier, the, the math is different. The model is different. One of the key numbers is is churn. How do you get people, people staying and, and keep paying? Well, you just have to keep giving them more and more stuff. And, and, and so... I, I then think about okay, but the objections would the objections we might get is yes, but I'm not selling digital products. I'm an accounting firm. But I think about that and think if I, I think about when I was in practice and and I I, I wish I had this idea and, and way back then because I I can see how I would apply it. So I was an accountant. I did a lot of tax, and I remember in the late 1990s uh, for a while I I had a lot of clients in the construction industry. In the construction industry back then, uh, there was a big issue in the in, a big issue where the tax authorities wanted to reclassify the subcontractors as, as employed because there's a lot more tax they collect. And, and so I went and researched and learned. I went on courses. I read books. I learned all about status and uh, and the, the rules around that, uh, and started uh, delivering services. But they were one to one. But if you're on a subscription model, I think you, you just think different. And I'd be thinking, okay, so I want to help my clients get their, their, their subcontractors, make sure they're self-employed and they don't have tax problems. So I might create a, a, a short video sharing the re- what they need to do now to make sure they save tax and avoid the problems. And then, my, then what I would do is I'd think about, well, how can I systemize and automate the process so that I can then deliver to all my clients because they're now all got the same problem because I'm niching. And so I think what I'm saying, Ron, and I'll pass back to you because it's your show. Uh, you're the expert today. But once you start thinking differently about what you do and you start focusing on innovating, because if you've got margin, MRR, the money's coming in. When the money's coming in every single month automatically, you then know that you've got the, the, that resource, that space to say, OK, I, I can now put aside some time to just do research and development and think how I can create more for my clients. How can I add more value and how can I deliver that in a way where... It doesn't. I don't. I'm not working one to one. I can. I can help all of my customers in an efficient way, and solve that particular problem. Uh, bingo, Mark. I, I, I mean, you just said it, it better than I ever could. I mean, it, this idea that we have to do services to add more value is just not true. And look, in the book, I I I, I stole this shamelessly from you. One of your videos, you talked about all these different ways you can add value. Um, accesses outside of normal business hours, uh, video or audio record all your meetings, set up a CEO or CFO roundtable, do a book of the quarter club. I mean, you had, and, and there's more, you had lots more. Uh, and all of these things have nothing to do with selling our hands. They're getting online and facilitating a discussion with your niche customer base about problems facing you know the restaurant industry or the construction industry or books that you've read that are really you know got great ideas in them and 
wow, that's really powerful. We don't leverage that enough. We think our only leverage is to do a service. And it's not. People want access to us. They want that convenience, that frictionless uh, relationship. And that's a big part of our value. In fact, that's much bigger, I think, than the services. The services are a means to an end. We can actually guide a customer from where they are to where they want to be, you know, some desired future state. Now, it doesn't have to be grandiose. It could be something like helping their kid get into college, you know, college planning, funding it, retirement planning, helping them grow their business. All of these different things are transformations, and we can do them over and over and over. The services we have to perform to guide that transformation are just a means to an end. Our focus should be the end. Like when a landscaper tells me, you're going to pay me for best curbside appeal. I don't care how he gets there. I don't care what his scope of work is. I don't have any care, care how many bushes he's going to plant or if he's going to change the trees in the backyard. I don't care. Just get me the best curbside appeal. That I care about. That's the outcome or what we're calling the transformation. Mm -hmm. And when you provide transformations, the customer is the product. <laughs> the customer is literally, you've changed the customer permanently. Like, uh, who was it? Herodotus said, you can't step into the same river twice because not only is the river changed, but you've changed. That's what a transformation is. That's the most powerful thing we can do. And we do this every day as accountants. And, and one other thing about uh, your point too, I think is really important. Another really cool thing that subscription does is it separates the cognitive load of pricing from the work. Customers already subscribe to your firm. They've already made that decision. That decision is over. And now it's just a matter of making sure they, they, you, that we're doing things proactively for them. We're guiding those transformations. We're always working on something with them uh, to help them improve. Because a lot of professionals talk about solving problems. You know, we're, we're great problem solvers and we always will be. Yes, we can get the, you know, the IRS off your back or we can help you comply with the Department of Compliance and all of that. But Mark, if all we do for our customers is solve problems, we just revert them back to the status quo. We don't progress them. Transformations progress them. And I think we need to start incorporating that language. Yes, we're great problem solvers, but we do so much more than that. We're, again, I think we're limiting ourselves by just saying we're problem solvers. Ron, that's profound. I love that. I, I can keep asking questions, but I, I did promise earlier that other people could ask some questions. And, of course, we want to find out a bit more about the book. Uh, but there are two questions in particular that people have been waiting very patiently. So let me let me just go to Bob's question for a second. I'll put it on the screen as well. Bob says, hi, Mark and Ron. Is it fair to say compliance, bookkeeping, and even the production of management accounts gets in the way of implementing a subscription model? I'm not sure um, because... At least accounts and bookkeeping and compliance is, is recurring. You know, that is something that we have that, that the customer needs every year. I mean, I don't think we have to be too grand about this idea of transformations. If you're a bookkeeper, you're, you can provide transformations just by being there for your customer when they need you. It's kind of like hospitality. You know, you're just there when they need you. Um, so, no, I don't, think, I don't think that's so much a hindrance. I think the hindrance to subscription is um, the unlearning that we have to do, either unlearning some tenants of value pricing or unlearning hourly billing, just like our, our move from hourly to value pricing required unlearning. Sure. Uh, and I, I, I think about, because I've, I've thought about a lot, of, a lot of these issues myself, so just like Bob, I think, could it work for, for things like the bookkeeping element? And, and I think the answer is yes. I know that a lot of people think, well, bookkeeping depends on the scope of the work. And so everyone's got to have a different price. But if that's just part of your overall offering, because we've talked about plussing, you, you, if, it's, if it's other things you're doing as well, uh, and, you, and, and once you then, obviously you'll charge a premium price. We've talked about that because of convenience and because you're plussing and you're getting the, 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 the premium end of the marketplace. And so the cost to deliver the bookkeeping 
A becomes a relatively smaller part of the overall subscription. And secondly, I guess that then makes you even more focused on saying, okay, how can I, what's the end result of bookkeeping? What am I trying to do for this client? Keep them legal. How can I do that as quickly as possible? In other words, what other automations can I do to, to make it easy as long as I get them the end result? Uh, and, and I know that's, I've got uh, one of my friends, to, uh, Teresa Slack on here, uh, who, who was doing some work for us with our bookkeeping because our previous bookkeepers didn't automate stuff. And I'm thinking, mm. well, it's mm. in their interest. They're, they're charging a fixed price every month. Why didn't they just put these automations in place? Uh, they'd still charge me the same fee. So I think, again, it comes back to this idea that we, we start thinking different. Once we've gone a subscription, we, we are thinking about how can we plus, how can we innovate, how can we change, improve the way that we deliver things and deliver a better outcome to the customer. Right. No, that's that's so true. And and, and look, I'll, I'll say something, I think, hopefully encouraging to all the bookkeepers out there. I think bookkeepers are better poised to do subscription than CPAs are. First off, bookkeepers tend to have fewer customers, right? They The, the ones I've seen have somewhere between 20 and 80. So that's a little bit easier to manage in terms of uh, making the transition. But bookkeepers have better and deeper relationships with their customers than CPAs do. CPAs pay lip service to the relationship, but they're in their office cranking. They're moving from, they're just like the fee for service doctors jumping around to 50 or 60 appointments to, uh, in one day. CPAs are doing the same thing. Bookkeepers have an enormous leg up here on the CPAs, I think, moving to subscription. That's it. Interesting thought. Uh, questions are flooding in now. Okay, so let's get to James now. I might not get your <laughs> questions in now. James says, love the idea. Uh, what stru uh, when structuring the price, what would we do with clients that have multiple businesses? Add a rider price like the doctors do for kids? Uh, how do we price this? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't have a, a one answer to that. I think it depends on the types of businesses that you have. I mean, are you talking about they have their main business and then they might have like a, you know, a bunch of rental properties and that's kind of considered a separate business. Those type, I mean, that's this this is part of the learning curve we're going to have to figure out those types of issues whether or not you have you, you know you just keep them uh one subscription per business uh which i have seen firms do but but if for instance i have a, a buddy who does nothing but dentists and dentists you know it, within a certain size only one or two offices so he doesn't do chains and uh, franchises and things like that but a lot of these dentists have side interests. You know, they might own uh, a, an apartment building or something. Now, if it's something he's comfortable to do, he just does it for them. He's on subscription. They pay him the same amount. But if, if it's, if it's a, a series of complicated things, then he might outsource that to another CPA and just say, I, 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 that's outside of my area of expertise. Just like a GP doctor would say, no, I don't do heart surgery. <laughs> You have to make that call. Absolutely. Uh, okay, uh, Lisa says, is everything you're talking about, including, uh, not MC squared, it's, <laughs> it's uh, M M MD, squared, MD, squared. MD squared, is right. this all covered in your book? I've just ordered it. So I tell you, well, as well as, on, I think that's probably a, a fairly simple answer to that, um, but it might be a good time as well just to let people know a bit more about your book as well. Yes, it is covered, Lisa. Thanks for the question. Uh, I've got a whole chapter uh, called the Direct Primary Care Disruptors that talks about the direct primary care doctors. These are the ones that charge a cheaper price point. So they're going after a, a, a different uh, economic status of people. And then it does have the history of MD Squared and quote some of the philosophy from MD Squared, points you to their website where you can go read what they stand for they're the largest concierge practice across the United States. They're thriving, um, you know, and they're expensive. They're, you're going to pay 25, 30 grand for these guys, um, for these concierge doctors. But if you're a CEO, even of a big account, you know, my, my former uh, colleague uh, uh, from a top 100 firm had a concierge doctor. And the thing is, Mark, they, they have to retrain their patients to come to them when when they have a medical issue a lot of the times people say well i'll just go to the er like my buddy stabbed his hand and had needed stitches and the doctor read him the riot act he said that's why you're paying me i want you to come to me he goes well it was sunday come to my house 
I've got a, I've got an office in my house. I could have stitched you up. You call me for anything that happens to you medically, even if, and if I can't do it, you know, whatever, I'll send you to ER. But give me first chance. I mean, they they want you to use them. Um, I'll give you another great example because something you said reminded me of this. Netflix um, had three hundred thousand subscribers, I think it was, and this is in the book as well. And these subscribers hadn't logged into Netflix in six months, watched nothing, never even logged in. Now they had accounts, they had passwords, all of that. They had watched stuff in the past, but they just kind of dropped off. Netflix, now you would think as a cost accountant, Mark, this is the best customer in the world. They're paying me every month and they're never using me. What could be better? It's not better under subscription. You want them to spend time with you. You want them to get hooked on your offering and make it part of their daily existence. Netflix sent them a, an email and said, if you don't log in, we hate to see you pay for something that you don't value and you're not using, we're going to cancel you. They unilaterally canceled 300,000 subscribers. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. That's a different mindset. That's a different mindset. Yep. And that's what we need. Absolutely. Uh, there's more questions coming in, Ron, but uh, I, I know we've got some links to put in to the comments. Uh, do you want to talk about, a bit about the links and how people can get your book? Yes. the be Well, Amazon, now, if you're in the UK, I understand that it's not going to be out on Amazon until late January, but I think maybe the Kindle version you might be able to access, like in the in the States or whatever. I'm not sure about that. Don't know if... Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm told that you can't download Amazon USA Kindle, like if you're in Australia, but I'm not sure. But it's up on Amazon. You can also go to the soul of enterprise.com slash times up. And there we're gonna have we're probably gonna have some type of further offering, uh, like Q and A sessions. We just did our book launch yesterday. Paul unfortunately couldn't be there, but I was there taking questions just like we are today. We're gonna do more sessions like that going forward. We're gonna also do interviews with some of these DPC docs and other people that are starting to use this model. So there'll be new offerings at uh, the soul of enterprise.com slash times up. Awesome. Um, oh, it is already available. Thank you, Lisa. I did not know that because it's not out in Australia yet. I think I've heard, but. Okay. Not available in Portugal yet. I'm still waiting for my copy. No. <laughs> <laughs> be with me soon. You haven't even I, got the one the publisher sent yet. Jeez, that's, depressing because <laughs> that was sent a long time ago uh never mind it'll it'll arrive at some point uh right uh ron have you got time for some more questions oh sure absolutely let's okay. keep going this is great um, and and i can see as well um that the link is appearing in the chat in the comments box now so anybody looking for the link it's there it's just appeared okay so uh let's look at what does jim rayner say i've not read this one yet jim says uh with different clients wanting and valuing different things, it makes sense to offer three levels of choice. Are we saying that by niching, we focus on that on just one of the three levels and make it a subscription? Yeah, let me give you an example of this. And again, this this goes, you remember that your pricing strategy is driven by your, your firm's overall strategy and its positioning. So again, are you a high-end steakhouse? Are you a McDonald's? Are you vegan? You know, you can't be all things to all people. Um, but the way it works in subscription, I'll take a very simple example. Say you've got a CPA firm or even a bookkeeping firm and you offer client accounting services and you do and you do, do tax work. And let's just say you also defend audits um, and then you might offer some advisory services, whether that's in HR or whatever your specialty is, whether you know that's FP&A type work or cash flow or you help with pricing or you help with KPIs, dashboards, things like that, whatever it might be in advisory. So under subscription, if you can still have three tiers, you can say, okay, if you're in the cast column and that's all we're doing is client accounting services for you, then you're covered for everything that we do under CAS. There are no differentiations. There are no, no, you do payroll. We do this. You have to decide what you're going to do and what you don't do. Because I think a firm is defined by the customers it doesn't have and the services it doesn't perform. But if you're trying to be like a full service, part-time CFO, whatever you want to call it, then you've got to figure out your standard service offering. But if they're in the cast column tier, 
they get everything that you can do, um, including room for growth, by the way, because I want my customers to grow. I want them to be flourishing. I, yes, it, it imposes more work on us, but so what? I want them to be you know, flourishing. Um, but then if they want you to do tax and they move to the tax call on the middle price tier, then they're covered for everything that they that you can do in tax. So if, if they get audited, you're going to be you're going to be defending them. So I had a guy, Mark, ask me in Austin this week, "Are you telling me that if 80% of my customers get audited, I would have to defend them?" I said, "Do you defend audit work?" And he said, "Yes, we do." And I said, "If 80% of your customers got audited, yes, under this model, you would have to defend them." And I said, "But listen, if 80% of your customers are being audited, you don't have a business model problem. You've got other problems." I couldn't believe the question, but that's just where our mind goes, right? It goes to the worst case scenario. And the third is, if they want some advisory work, then they step up to the third tier and you do the advisory work. Now, maybe they only want a project or two and it only takes you three, four, five months, then let them slide back. You have to make it very easy for them to move around in subscription. They have to be able to cancel the subscription at any time. There can be no minimum contracts, no lock-ins. You've got to trust your value. It, it, this is a psychological or a behavioral economic point, Mark, and I know you study behavioral economics, so you're into this too. Mm -hmm. It's very counterintuitive. When you give the customer the freedom and the option to, to cancel at any time, they're less likely to do it because they know they have an escape route. It's the weirdest thing, but it's mm -hmm. empirically true. That's why every touch point you see with Amazon or Netflix the cancel button's right there. It's not difficult to find. You can cancel these things. This is not the old subscription model, you know, the Columbia Record House, where you know you buy twenty CDs or whatever it was for a penny, and then they lock you in for. I still think they're hitting my credit card. Uh, you can't get out of it. Well, this is the exact opposite. You can get out anytime. Great point, um, and thank you, Lisa, for for saying that as well. Uh, if you've enjoyed this so far, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, a couple more questions, then I think we'll probably think about wrapping up. There was a question came in. There was a question came in from Teresa about capacity. She said, uh, "I wonder how best to manage capacity planning with this model. We want to be responsive and ensure our clients are getting fast and top quality service." And she loves the model. Absolutely, Teresa. You've got to have spare capacity, which, in my mind, and Mark, I think this was as true in value pricing as it as it was as it is in subscription. You should not be anywhere near 50, 60% capacity. You've got to always reserve capacity. My eye doctor should have capacity for the group of payments that pay or patients that pay him for that you know, special access. Uh, and he doesn't, he has zero capacity because he's running full tilt. You've got to have, you can't burn. And, and plus I just think that helps when you run at 90%, 95% capacity. You know, we, we rail against this in value pricing that firms have to put capacity before revenue. And yet most firms want to have the revenue there. They want to be busting at the seams before they hire somebody. That is so backwards. Most businesses have to put enormous capacity in before they, they earn a dollar of revenue. Think of what FedEx needed to deliver the first package. I can't even fathom it. But they had to have airplanes and trucks and boxes all over all these different countries across the US, it, the fixed cost almost bankrupted them. But you know, most businesses have to put capacity first and I don't think you should run anywhere near 50 or, or, or let's say 60% capacity. Absolutely agreed. I, I often say that one of the biggest problems holding firms back is too many clients. Uh, I think you use the same number. I often say you shouldn't have more than 50 clients because you haven't got the time to have the regular interactions. And one of the things we do know is that when we make unexpected, proactive contact with a client, George, I'm just thinking of you. I just thought I'd give it, pick up the phone, say, how are you going? Very often what happens, they say, well, I'm glad you've called because I've got a problem right now. And very often we come away with higher value work. The more interactions with our clients, the more we come away with, with, with stuff that's, that's worth more, more valuable. And if and, we've got 200 you, clients, we can't do that. We can't, and, and Mark, even if we don't come away with the service, we might have given them a kernel of knowledge that helps them see that problem in a clearer light. This is what I mean about moving away from the idea that we need to stack services like bricklayers. We don't. 
sometimes we just need to have conversations with our customers. So when we say that relationships don't scale, I believe that's true. And I think you're right around the number of customers. It's what's the Dunbar number? The number of people that you can know in a group is around 75. I mean, that's that's kind of any human's physical capacity to know, you know, and I'm talking about know them more than just an acquaintance, you know, but it's called the Dunbar number. It's fascinating. But anyway, um, just because relationships don't scale doesn't mean we can't grow a business that's based on relationships and scale it. We can. MD squared is proof, but each doctor only deals with 50 patients or 50 families. Great. I'm just checking. There are a couple of questions, but I didn't fully understand them. So I'm going to apologize in advance that I don't think, well, I don't understand them because it's because I'm a little bit simple, but I'll, I'll ask them just in case it makes sense to Ron, uh, which is much more likely. Deborah said, can you give subscription models sample for a bookkeeping accounting plusing service? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, well, I understand now. well, if you if you go to a conference and you learn something new, bring it back to your customers and uh, plus the offering, make it available to your customers. Um, maybe you might learn a new app or something that's applicable in your in your customer's world. Bring it yeah. back to them. It can be simple as that. It can be, hey, I read a book and I think the following customers would really benefit from this given the issues they're having in their business or their industry, whatever it might be. Uh, I, I think, like you said, Mark, there's so many different ways to plus our offering that don't have to do with selling our hands, but using our minds. Absolutely. I remember when I was back in practice years ago, I'd, I would go to a tax CPE course and I would be thinking about, oh, that's an interesting tax planning idea. How can I roll that out to as many clients as possible? And I'd be thinking about the marketing side. Well, what, what messages would I send out to everybody so they all know about it? Whereas I think a lot of people just go for the CP points, they learn that thing, they fire it away in case a client ever asks for it. And that's the wrong approach. We need to be more proactive, taking this knowledge we learn at conferences, at exhibitions, at QB Connect, these new apps, as you've said, and thinking, how can we help our clients? Yeah, yeah. And it's not that difficult. And it, when you don't have as many customers and you're not on that hamster wheel treadmill of trading you know, dollars for services, you can take the time to have those conversations with your customer, like you were saying, or even meeting with them and demonstrating the app or some new type of thing that's uh, really cool that you've learned. Um, and, you know, we see we see accountants and bookkeepers do this all the time. You know, maybe they learned, a, I remember talking to one a CPA firm that just learned a new retirement, a new way to approach retirement planning. Well, geez, if they had fewer customers, they'd be able to show that to everybody. Now, maybe not all customers would want it, but the ones that did, it would be made available to them without changing the price. Without changing the price, by the way. That's, we're, again, we're separating the work from the price. They're, they're it, two different, you know, things. <laughs> I'm conscious we've gone over the hour, and I want to be respectful of your time, Ron. No, I, a, I can't no, see any to... more questions, I don't think, but uh, it may be people ask questions without putting a QQ in front, so I might have missed them. So if I have missed your question, you might want to just retype it in. But I think it's about time to wrap up. Ron, is there anything more you want to say, something that we've not actually talked about yet? Yeah, I'll give you what the last chapter is about, Mark, and it's called Please. What's Next. Yeah. And... Um, Look, I, I'm, I don't claim to have a crystal ball. We wrote The Firm of the Future. That was kind of a tongue-in-cheek title. We, we can't see the future any better than anybody else. I'm not a futurist. I just kind of look out the window. Um, but I do know that I can safely say subscription is just a way station. There's going to be more evolution in business models. There always is in a dynamic, healthy market economy. And we're going to see other business models enter. And I think the big one is going to be customers are going to get to a point where they don't want to pay for promises. They want to pay for performance. So we're only going to pay when you deliver on that transformation or that outcome. So I'll give you just one quick example. Uh, drug company, I think it was Johnson & Johnson, might have been Glaxo, Smith & Klein, I forget. One of them made a drug called Rapatha. And Rapatha uh, is about 12 grand a year regimen so it's an expensive drug and it prevents heart attacks and strokes. And when the drug company negotiated both with NHS 
and the uh, America, you know, Medicare system, they said, listen, if somebody's on this drug and they're taking it and they get a heart attack or a stroke, you get your money back. Wow. wow. That's where we're, that's where we're moving. Absolutely. Yep. We're not, we're, we're not going to pay for promises anymore. And, and I, I just think, you know, there's going to, we're already starting to see iterations of this model. There's more examples than of the, uh, of this in the book than the drug one, but that's, that's one of my favorite to explain it. Um, but I think that's where we're headed. So we kind of speculate on what's next. And, you know, when, when something happens that you look at that challenges your worldview, like subscription challenged my worldview about value pricing, it kind of blew up some tenants. And I, I spent four or five chapters talking about value pricing is still important. The principles we teach about value pricing are still important, but some of them have been blown up. Scope creep has been blown up. Uh, I think even three options has been blown up. I think you can structure it. You could have two options with subscription and that would be fine. I think it's Spotify or one of them, maybe Pandora, I forget, has just two options for their subscription, for their music. One's a free free option and then one's, you know, where you pay a premium. <clears throat> and it's really interesting, 80% of their revenue comes from the premium option, which is mm -hmm. fascinating. So I, I don't think you need three options anymore. That's not, that's no longer an, a requirement. Um, but other things are still true, like value subjective and all those different economic theories that we teach are still foundational, but the way they're implemented is different. Wow. Let's do one final question, because I think it's a quick one um, from my friend David over in Texas. He says, uh, I'm thinking how I can apply this information in my practice. Where can we find out more about future Q&As, coaching sessions, events? Is anything listed in the Soul of Enterprise website? Well, maybe, Mark, I can come back and spend more time with you. But um, Well, I was thinking also, that. I, I, would, I would love to do another session, perhaps a deeper dive session for uh, my audience. And if you're ever willing to do that, I would be so grateful. Uh, I, I am. I am. So let's, let's, let's schedule it and get it on the books. But in the meantime, you can also check out the Soul of Enterprise dot com slash times up. I don't think it's up there yet, but we will be putting up um, when we're going to have more events and Q and A sessions and things like that. We may even decide to do a a membership mark for a while where people can join to learn to take a really deep dive on subscription, bring in some practitioners. I'll tell you, there's one firm out there that went from six hundred thousand to eleven million dollars using subscription. He does CFO type services for marketing agencies. That's his narrow niche. Average customer is something like $85,000. And he's got 150 of them. Now he's got a team that only handles, I, I forget the number, I want to say 20 or something, um, the customers at a time. So he scaled it. But each person that works is, you know, limited, just like MD squared is to 50 families. Um, and that's a very successful subscription example. So we're going to get people like him on and other uh, professionals that use this model to talk about that. So there, there'll be more information at the soul of enterprise.com slash times up. Awesome. And yes, I'd love to have a conversation, Ron, about doing some more stuff for, for my audience, people like David. Uh, so we can definitely work on that. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm looking. I'm sorry. I'm sidetracked because I keep looking at the comments coming in. Coming in, Ron. <laughs> There's so many, many great comments. Uh, like Linda Rolf says, "Great stuff. Thanks so much, Mark and Ron." Uh, uh, so I just want to say thank you so much, Ron. I, I've I found this fascinating. Uh, I've learned some stuff. It's always an honour uh, to get to debate stuff around pricing and what's happening next. Uh, and I yeah, we'll it do too. it again. Yeah, and it, and awesome. I, it's just, and I'm sorry that I've not seen you for such a long time. COVID kind of got in the way, and and Sarah and I, Did. we do need to get across to the US. We will be doing that at some point, perhaps not 2023, but 2024, perhaps, and we'll definitely be uh, coming over towards California. Awesome. I need to get your way. I've only been once to Portugal, so it's such a beautiful place. Great food, great wine. Jeez. You're Love welcome anytime, Ron. We will happily host you. So thank awesome. you so much. Uh, thank and, you, Mark. And thank you to everybody who's come along. Thank you for all the great comments. I'm going to play out with some music for a few minutes. It gives me a chance to read the comments, put them on the screen. Uh, so I, haven't, I will get to your comments. Thank you, Ron. And have a great Christmas, everybody, and a great New Year. Relax. 
and get ready for 2023. Bye for now. Awesome.